Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Today we have with us Dr. Ng Yen Yen again to speak on Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta, turning the wheel of Dhamma. Before that, we will have preliminary homage to the Buddha, Brother Jerry. Let us pay homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Good morning. Today is a uh, topic will be the turning, turning of the wheel of the Dharma, Dharma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. Pavatana means turning, wheel, chaka, and Dharma. So this is the turning of the wheel of Dharma. So why did I choose this? Uh, because it is the first discourse. And I want to introduce to you all the appreciation of suttas. Suttas are the teachings of the Buddha. And as disciples of the Buddha, we have to read the suttas so that we can follow the guidance of what the Buddha taught us. So being disciples, you have to get access to the Buddha's teachings because the Buddha's teachings are swakato. It is a sanditiko, can be seen. It is akaliko, it is timeless. 2,600 years ago, the Dharma then and the Dharma now is the same. And opanaiko, you can enter upon it. Pachatam vedi tabu vinuhiti. Each person who will do it wisely will know it for himself. So the suttas are the teachings or the discourses given by the Buddha to his disciples on a certain point of Dharma. So we want to read the suttas to understand what the Buddha is conveying. And then from what he convey, we can practice so that we can realize what he realized. And all his 45 years, there were about 17,000 suttas. And these, all these suttas will guide us to enlightenment and realization. So uh, it is a uh, uh, choice because this is the first sutta. So through this first sutta, I want to show you how to practice through the sutta. Now we know that this is the first discourse and the will of Dharma has been turned. Now we know that the Buddha as a princeling in a rich household, had sense pleasures. Okay, three palaces for the three different seasons. But all these pleasures did not give him satisfaction. When he saw old men, a diseased man, a sick man, and a dead man, he, by seeing these sights, he knew that there was suffering and that his only goal. Now, uh, footballers, Whatever, their only goal is to end suffering. And that is his only goal. So this goal, this goal to put the ball into the goal was his only goal. And that this goal is to understand suffering and the end of suffering. So it is, becomes his mind object, his total mind object. So when he sees suffering, he wants to know the origin. 
He wants to end the suffering. He wants to know how to end it. So this was his goal. And this total, this only goal, occupied his entire mind. Okay? So when he decided to, uh, when he decided that he will live his household life, because the household life is cluttered, and that he wants to know the truth. So that's why it's called Satcha, the truth. He went in search. So his first two teachers, the first teacher, Alara Kalama, taught him to go to the seventh jhana, the base of infinite nothingness. Okay, yeah? So, but he did not realize. He said he still had passion, he still had craving, he still suffers. So he went to the next teacher. And the teaching, then the next teacher brought him to the highest, according to, at that time, was the eighth jhana, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Yet, after he comes out of the jhana, he still has passion, he still has suffering. So he knows that this is not the end goal. So then he went in search for the next way out of this. Then he went with five other ascetics and at that time self-mortification was the, believed to be the way to enlightenment. So he practiced extreme enlightenment, extreme austerity, extreme self-mortification. He eat very little, he tortured his body etc, etc, right, etc, that his eyes were sunken, you know, and his uh, ribcage can be seen. When he touched his front, he can feel his spine, and he became grey, so that he fell over where his pee and poo was. When he touched his hair, it all fell off. So it was at this extreme practice of self-mortification, that he says, uh, this is only giving me pain. I want to realize the end of pain, not having to suffer this pain of self-mortification. So then he thought about his anapanasati, which he did as a child. And he thinks that this may be the way out. Because he says, this pleasure that he get from Anapanasati is not of the sensual pleasures of the five sense objects. This is just breathing in and breathing out. And that he need to sustain himself. And fortunately, he took, you know, milk rice from Shujata and that he then can practice. And then he realized, he realized, you know, his previous past lives in the first watch of the night, other people's past lives in the second watch of the night. And then he realized the end of his developments and the end of a craving at the third watch of the night. So the first two realizations is about karma, or what people did and then what happened to them. And the last is that he will not produce any more karma because he has got rid of cravings. So then, he realized and that then he had said to be five weeks to seven weeks he will contemplating and the two contemplations that were useful for us was first the dependent origination okay ignorance and then the end of ignorance and then the four foundations of mindfulness these are useful for us then he thought about who should he share this. And he thought about Alara Kalama, but he died seven days ago. And Udaka Ramabuta, who died one day ago. So they were high practitioners who reborn into the Arupa worlds and that they have no chance to hear the Dharma. And here we have the Dharma 2,600 years later so we must treasure the Dharma. Here, then he 
talked about he, the five ascetics. Now, these five ascetics, through his divine eye, he saw that they were in Banaris. So, in Banaris, at the Deer Park, he gave this first discourse. So, when you read the Sutta, you have to read through the whole Sutta and pick up the essential points. So, I believe that you have read the Sutta because this was given uh, quite uh, some time ago. So, you see what the main points of the Sutta are. So, the main points of the Sutta are these are the main points. He tells us, do not go to extremes, that the definition of the Four Noble Truths, the 12 aspects of the Four Noble Truths, and the first Arya. And because there's a first Arya, then the wheel can be turned. Right. So then, these are the four points. So I will elaborate the four points. So when he sees his five companions, he says, do not go to self-indulgence. The extremes is self-indulgence. Okay? And that the other extreme is self-mortification. Do not go to the extremes. Why? Because it says self-indulgence uh, is low, common, Ordinary. Hino gamo putojaniko. Right. And then he says, uh, it is also ignoble. It's not for the noble man. It's ignoble. And it have, uh, brings a lot of misery. And he says, self mortification will have a lot of pain, dukkha. And it's ignoble and it is miserable. So this both share self-indulgence with the sense objects and self-mortification shares uh, being ignoble and being miserable. Now you see self-indulgence with the sense pleasures is low, common, and that is ordinary. So he says you must go to the middle path. This middle path is the Noble Eightfold Path. And he elaborated the Noble Eightfold Path that there is right understanding, right thoughts, right speech, action, livelihood, right effort, mindfulness, and then right concentration. He says when you practice the middle path, you will have VIP treatment. And what is VIP? You have the vision. You have the insight. And you will have the peace of Nibbana. So he says that to them. That don't go to these two extremes because of these characteristics. That you have to go to the middle path. And he says the middle path will give you vision, insights, and peace. So here, he defined this. So this is the first part. That's why the Noble Eightfold Path is called the middle path. Then he talked about the definition. The definition of uh, the Four Noble Truths. So the definition, he talked about suffering. Okay, the Four Noble Truths. Say suffering, that there is an origin and there is a cessation and then there is a path. Then he defined what is suffering. He defined that birth, aging, disease and death is suffering. Then he defined that sorrow, sadness, agitation, pain, despair, distress, depression, is suffering. He knows this. He has been through this. 
he knows the suffering of this. And that he went on to say that if you are with people that you don't like, you suffer. And that if you are away from people that you like, you suffer. And if you cannot get the things you want, you suffer. You want this, ma? So he says, in short, the five aggregates of clinging is suffering. He says, all this because you cling, because of clinging. So, if you don't understand five aggregates, as long as you cling to something, you suffer. So he defined suffering. So it's bad, sad. You're not getting what you want. Yeah? These two not getting what you want and that you are away from things you like. So what is the origin of suffering? The origin of suffering is that you have this craving that brings renewed existence, that means rebirth, renewed existence. This craving gives you renewed existence, delighting in this and that. In other words, he says, in short, in short, huh? he says it's karma tanha. Karma tanha, and then it is bhava tanha. And then it is vi bhava tanha. Bhava tanha. And uh, Kama Tanha, this is this, you want, you want, you want sense pleasures, you want sense pleasures, you want to have your views, you don't want to be, aware, don't want uh, bad things, non-existence, you wish this doesn't exist, right, yeah? so all these views also, views Wanting this to him and that we Baba. Wanting this not to have, wishing this not to be there, wishing COVID is not there, it's a bad dream, everything will be all right, you know. So this is views. Underpinning all these views is ignorance. Ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. So he says uh, that the origin, this origin, uh, there is a reason for the suffering, and that the cessation can be realized. He says that it can be realized if you give up, if you abandon, if you release, if you refuse. They call it chago, patinesego, muti, and then analayo. So you give up this craving, you abandon this craving, you release. And when people offer you again, no thank you, then this is refuse. So do you, when people refuse, do you have this, I want still, oh never mind, never mind, but I still want in my heart. Right, so you have to know it for yourself. Then the path, the path is a noble eightfold path. There is the right view or the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. You have to keep that goal in mind that there is suffering. Okay? This suffering. And that because what is this suffering? You say is that will it cause suffering for myself, for others? If you cause suffering for myself and others, and you know that this is this is it, eh? then you would have right thoughts. And the right thoughts is renunciation of sense pleasures, non ill will, non cruelty. 
Okay, yeah. So we have then because suffering, then you have right speech. You don't want others to suffer. You will say the right things. So right speech, right action, right living, right effort, right mindfulness, and then right concentration. He says that this is the Four Noble Truth. So he defined suffering. This is it. The origin is craving. This is it. This is cessation, how to realize it. This is it. And then what is the way? This is it. You must have the right understanding foremost. That is your mind object. Then this is the definition. After the definition, he talked about 12 aspects. So what is these 12 aspects? There are three phases. This understanding of the Four Noble Truths has three phases. First, you say that this knowledge, that suffering, origin, cessation, and a path. The second phase, the second phase is that you should, should know this. You should know it. You should abandon this. You should abandon this. You should cease. You should see the cessation of this. You should develop the path. Should abandon, should realize. So you should understand. You should, huh? So when we are on the path, we try because we should understand, we should abandon, we should realize, we should develop the path. So this is the second phase for the training on the path. Then we come to the third phase. The third phase is that I had understood. I had understood. I had abandoned. I had realized. I had developed. So it is had abandoned, had realized, had developed. And then the Buddha says, no. If I have not understood in these 12 aspects, I do not say I'm enlightened. Only after I have understood the Four Noble Truths through these 12 aspects, through these Four Noble Truths in its three phases, then I say that I am enlightened. And then he declared to the world, he declared to the world, in the land uh, where there are holy men, devas, maras, he declared that I am enlightened. Before that, he never said he was enlightened. Only after he fully realized, then he says he's enlightened. And then, when he had said that, while he was proclaiming that, the first Arya was born. The first Arya was Kondana. And he says, whatever arises, ceases. Whatever conditions arises, whatever conditions arises, ceases. So he says, Yam Kinchi Samudaya, and that Saba Tam Niroda, Niroda Damam. So it says, whatever conditions, that arise, those conditions will also cease. So he says, all conditional things. So he sees, uh, he just see, you know, he just, so the Buddha talked about the four definitions of the four noble truths. 
Then he talked about the 12 aspects, and he was, as he was listening, 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 suffering arises, origin, cessation, path. When he sees that arising, ceasing, arising, ceasing, he says all conditions arise and cease. So this is the, when the devas, when the earth gods hear it, they, they, you know, they exalted and says that the will of the Dharma has been turned. The earth gods rejoice. And then it reverberated through the heavens, through the six heavens. So you have the heaven of the four great kings. You have the Tawatimsa, the Yama, the Tusita, the Nimana, Rati, and then the Paranimita, Vasavati. So these six heavens, the sensual fears, rejoice. So one passed on this rejoiced that there is a first Arya, a stream enterer. And then after these Deva realms, you miss the Mara realm because the Mara tells Buddha, you know, you have realized already, you can, you know, you can pass away. So the Mara didn't rejoice. Then he goes up to the Brahma world. And the Brahma world rejoiced. Then there was a big earthquake. And there was a huge radiance. And then the Buddha says, Kondana knows. So the first turning, the turning of the wheel with the first Arya disciple, Kondana knows. So one fifth of the five understood. So the, the rest of them and Kondana himself understood in the second discourse. So this first discourse was talking about the Four Noble Truths. So you can see Kondana knows and his name then become Anya Kondana. So this is the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta and the Buddha says that once this will is turned, it will not stop. No holy man no ascetic, no being, no deva, no mara will be able to stop its turning. It will uh, carry on sasana. So this is his exaltation. So the sasana is there. So we have to practice. Because he says, like all things, this will also end if there's no respect for the Buddha, for the Dharma, for the Sangha, for the training, for the concentration. And it will also end if the four foundations of mindfulness is not practiced. Because mindfulness uh, it is important. So you see, in these four noble truths, he link it with the 12 D.O. How he link it with the 12 D.O.? So we have ignorance. You will have volition. You will have consciousness. You will descend to your mind body to touch your sixth sense through the sixth sense space to contact. And then you have feeling, craving, clinging, becoming, and then birth, and sadness. So he is dispelling uh, ignorance, the four noble truths. So in dispelling ignorance, uh, then you will end the suffering. So in the 12 DO, it's also the four noble truths. For the suffering, there is an origin. The origin of suffering is becoming. If you end becoming, there is no suffering. The reason for becoming, the origin, eh? so you see suffering, origin, cessation. So you have suffering, the origin, if you get away, you get rid of the origin, the becoming, then no suffering. 
If there is becoming, you let go of the clinging, no becoming. You let go of each origin, there is no suffering. So in this, there is also arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. So you also see the Four Noble Truths here. You see arising of ignorance and cessation of ignorance. So he says that you, for the Four Noble Truths, you will have also VIP. So he says you will have vision, you will have insight, you will have panya, you will have vija, knowledge, to counter your ignorance. And then he say aloka, aloko, light. So this is, he says this, you dispel the craving, right? And then you see it truly, so you can dispel origin. So the origin of suffering is ignorance. You dispel with uh, four noble truths. And that you have to do the four foundations of mindfulness. Because you have to know whether you have craving, whether this feeling is pleasant or unpleasant, that you want it, that you don't want it. So wanting and not wanting is bhava and vi bhava. So this is knowing your feelings, knowing your contact. So on each step, it can be broken. If it breaks this, all goes. If you break this, all goes. Right? If you see very clearly, six sense based consciousness, mind, body, all goes. If you see craving, all goes. So he sees how to see. You must be mindful of your mind and body because this is the only tool you have, your mind and the body. So this is the way that you have to be Focusing, mindful of your mind and body. And all that you have to keep in mind is the ignorance and the four noble truths to counter it. So, then now, this is the uh, Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. In relation to 12DO, and the four foundations of mindfulness. Because four foundations of mindfulness is foremost in the seven factors of enlightenment. Right, yeah? In the seven factors of enlightenment, you have to investigate the Dharma. You have to have exert with effort. Right? When you have exert your effort, then you must have energy. When your energy, you will have rapture, tranquility, joy, concentration. And then release. That is concentration, knowledge, and then uh, liberation. So you have to practice the four noble truths. So how to practice now? Then we say how to practice. Uh? So you, we hear this uh, four noble truths, the suffering. The four noble truths in suffering. Then we now talk about the practical aspect. <laughs> okay. So, what is the practical aspect? So, COVID is the, the suffering, right? So, how do we talk about COVID and non-COVID conditions? So, COVID uh, is the current raging disease. Along with this raging disease, there are other usual business, right? So, we talk about non-COVID and COVID. 
So COVID is suffering. Agree? So the origin of the COVID uh, is a virus. The origin of this suffering is COVID. And this has to be gotten rid of, give up, abandon, remove. Right, and then there's a path to its removal. So when we hear this knowledge, uh, because it's a new thing, when there's a new knowledge, uh, so the scientists will tell you new things. So you have to knowledge the ignorance path. Uh, you have to sort of, this mundane knowledge is for the overcoming the ignorance. So you, in mind, your 12DO. So suffering COVID, there's origin to this, is the disease, the virus. Then there is a cessation, you want to stop its contact. Contacting it, then there is a way. So once people tell you this, uh, and then how not to contact it, you have to isolate yourself. You have to seclude yourself. You have to have this suffering in mind, foremost in mind. So you have to be disciplined. Not only Dharma, you need the discipline. So the Buddha says the Dharma and the discipline will lead you out of suffering. So if you have the discipline, like the, what's happening in China, they have the discipline. When they discipline themselves and do social distancing, guarding themselves with a mask, right, huh? washing their hands, then it can end. But if you think, you know, when we know that this is, they have come out from it. So we have to learn from people who have come out from it. So before a vaccine can be sort of inoculated to the population, we have to think of the non-pharmacological way. So this suffering, this is disease, right? Yeah? And this disease cause of, uh, of sorrow, agitation, etc. And that, you know, people uh, want to go to enjoy their sense pleasures. They, when they suffer from, you know, alienation from their sense pleasures, their craving for their sense pleasures, craving uh, for the sense pleasures, and their view that it's okay, it's a disease of the old. Then they will do otherwise. They will come into contact. When they contact, when they're enjoying themselves, when they think that it is other people's disease. So then you will continue to flourish because there is no social distancing. There is no guarding. There is no cleaning. This cleaning of the hands uh, have to clean off the taints in the mind, Taint, clean off the ignorance in the mind. It's not only physical, it had to be mental. If it's not mental, then you see the 12 DO, ignorance must be dispelled. Uh, and then volition, you know, if you have ignorance, the volition will lead you to suffering. So you can see uh, it is craving for sense pleasures that cause the increase in the number of the COVID in Singapore, your Bakute, your Zook, whatever. So we know, and that this uh, thinking uh, that it is not my problem. It is other people's problem. The government will take care. We have to play a part in all this. So this is COVID, right? Then we have the usual thing. We have sadness, Losses. But this is the nature of things. Who is it that doesn't die? Right, when we grow old, so we can die at different stages in, of age. That is the nature. The birth registrar or the death registrar, 
the death registrar have different ages, and everybody has an ancestor. We say ancestor worship because there's somebody in the family that has died. Ancestor worship. So we have Qingming. So Qingming reminds us that there will be people who die. And we are also going to be those beings uh, that are called ancestors later on. The descendants will sort of pay respect. So we have to know that suffering arises because of craving. And that craving, uh, wanting things, clinging to things, will give you a lot of suffering. Rejecting things will also cause you to have a lot of suffering. So the Buddha says, uh, you have to walk the Noble Eightfold Path. And a Noble Eightfold Path has the foremost is the right understanding. The right understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Then you will have the right thoughts of renouncing sense pleasures renouncing sense pleasures, you will have non-ill will to yourself and to others. You don't want to spread the disease. You don't want to get it and you don't want others to get it. You are not cruel to yourself or to others. So you must have the right thoughts. You have to renounce the sense pleasures. You have to renounce the sense pleasures, non-ill will and non-cruelty. Then you have the right speech. And right speech is very important. And there are four parts of the right speech. And the right speech is so important because it means that if you have right speech, you keep your fourth precept. If you keep your fourth precept that you only say the true things, the truth will come to you. If you do not keep the fourth precept, if you lie, false speech, then a lie will take a lie, a lie will take another lie, and you'll be totally confused where, 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 is the, where the lie started. You don't know, you have to fabricate a story. So false speech, if one has false speech, one cannot see Nibbana. Because one who is false speech has a lot of craving for greed, hatred, for something, you know. And in greed and hatred, there is delusion because they think that there is a self and not just arising and ceasing. And so, false speech, frivolous speech, malicious speech, harsh speech, this right speech is detrimental to your goal of enlightenment. So, right speech, because you're saying something, it has to be truthful. Because this truth is for yourself when you say it, and it's also for another. If you do not have right speech, you will cause another to fall. Not for his benefit or welfare. So you have the wrong view, you have the wrong intentions, and you have the wrong speech. So you must have the right view, then you have the right speech. Then you have the benefits and the welfare of your own and others. So that you do not torment yourself or others. So right speech with right intentions is very, very important. So when they say right thoughts, sometimes they use right intentions. So if you have right intentions, you will have right speech. If you have wrong intentions, then you have the whole wrong way. You know, your 12 the old wrong way, and you will suffer. So, you will have the right action. Your right action is do not kill, do not steal, do not have sexual misconduct, do not have false speech and the other aspects of it, and do not take intoxicants. So, you say right action. So when we say right action, we also do not want to kill in our minds. If we pass germs around, we are killing others silently. 
So we don't want to kill. We don't want to steal other people's lives. So we, this, this part of this sexual misconduct, this sexual misconduct is considered low. You know? This sense indulgence is hino, gamo, putojaniko, anario, ana samhito. So the Buddha says it very clearly. So it is to say that the precepts have to be taken. If you are going to be intoxicated, this intoxicated state uh, is a confused and blurred state. You don't know what you are doing. So, you know, if you do not take anything, you are also blur. Then we have to not add on to our ignorance, add on to any intoxicants like alcohol or drugs that make us more confused in a world of our own, not in touch with reality. So here we must have right livelihood and we have to make an immense effort to do the right things, to purify, to remove the defilements and that to grow the wholesome. So avoid evil, do good, purify the mind. It has to have a lot of effort. You have no effort, you can't see the end of suffering. So you have to put in a tremendous uh, effort. So in that particular Samyutta, Satcha Samyutta 56, truth. This Satcha Samyutta again and again and again stress that effort is required. And the Buddha has also exhorted us before he passed on into his Mahaparinibbana. It says, strife. Strife means you have to put in your right effort, your diligence, your ardency to practice. Because we don't want to waste our human life. Our human life is precious. And it's, you know, it's like, the, he says, uh, an occasion where you throw a loop uh, with a hole and uh, one eye turtle comes out no? once in a 100 years to go through. What's the chance of a one eye blind turtle uh, getting into the hook with a hole? And that, he says, is the human life. So you have this human life and the uh, death is overhanging you because any time you can go because of this disease raging and other things as well, can be an accident, can be a assault, etc. Can be conditions of the, the reasons for the death. Then you have to, you have to just uh, waste another life. Because life is to understand the Dharma. Because once you understand the Dharma, there is no more rebirth to suffering. Because all things are impermanent. And so it is important to uphold practices that you know, support your own well-being uh, physically and mentally. So right mindfulness and right concentration. So we said the four foundations of mindfulness. Then you can get into the one-pointed right concentration. And right concentration is at the end of the Noble Eightfold Path. So then you can penetrate through your 12 aspects of the Four Noble Truth. Then you have the right knowledge with the right liberation. So this is practical aspects. So you must have the goal in mind, the goal in your mind, the mind object must be this. If you have suffering, you have to ask yourself, what is your craving? What is it that you want? Can you give it up? If you can give it up honestly and truly, and that you can refuse it, even if it's offered to you, then you can say cessation is realized. Towards karma tana, to sense pleasures, to views, to becoming, and then having foremost in your mind, that no, there's ignorance. 
Ignorance is we do not know what we do not know. So we have to practice, avoid evil, do good, purify the mind. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. So I hope I have uh, able to, through this sutta, talk about the sutta, the essence of the sutta, and then uh, the practical aspects. You have to keep in mind, it's a very practical aspect. What I'm doing, before I do, during when I do, after I do, am I cause suffering to others and myself? You have to be having this mind object. And that's how you will walk the Noble Eightfold Path. With this foremost in the mind, then you have right thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right practice, right meditation practice. So I think we go for questions and answers. You have to reflect uh, on this uh, sutta. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Um, the first question is, how do we choose which suttas to read first? As there are thousands of suttas in the four main nikayas that uh, teachers always point us to. I think uh, if you have the time, you just read all the suttas. Right, and then uh, once you choose when after you have read all the suttas, then you can say, oh, which one resonates with me? But I suggest that for become beginners uh, to the practice, I find that the connected discourses, like connected discourses like this, is the Samyutta Nikaya connected discourse. It's uh, sort of connected with a certain topic. Then they tell you all about that topic. And it's very short. So I suggest that you read the Samyutta Nikaya first because it's short, sharp, and to the point. And it is the leader of, the, of this Samyutta Nikaya in the first Buddhist council was Maha Kasapa. And he collected all the discourses. You know, he uh, uh, systematically put it under whatever connected so it is truth everything about truth he will put it under there right so you can if you have certain things that you have a problem with like your vedana your feelings then you can read vedana samyutta so you can look through you know there are 50, 56 topics you know connected discourses so you can read through if you have certain problems you want certain clarification, you can read. So I suggest that you read, start off with Samyutta Nikayas. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Any questions from the floor? You mean after this, uh, it's all very clear? <laughs> no questions, sir. Uh. No questions from the audience also? Questions from the audience? No questions. No questions? <laughs> so no question then, I will say something. Huh? <laughs> Doctor, what are the three views of Bhava Tanha? Bhava Tanha, right. So Bhava Tanha itself, the Bhava Tanha itself is becoming. So in the so in the twelve do, the twelve do where they say Bhava, it is the becoming. So in the becoming.
כן. So this is becoming, this is Baba. When you become, becoming uh, to the new existence, becoming, uh, so it is Baba. Clinging will drive you to becoming. So if you cling for certain foods, then you make a beeline. You take the bus, you take a transport, you go to the hawker center. So you stand in front of it. Uh, so then that's the becoming. Once you cling and then you operationalize your clinging, that is becoming. Right, so this becoming is because of clinging. As long as there is clinging, there will be becoming. So you cling to what? You cling to sense pleasures. You cling to sense pleasures. So the sense pleasures may be any of the five sense objects or your six, your mind, planning, planning for elections. You know, there are certain world leaders planning. Bhava Tanha, I want this. So I plan for something. Like we have this, uh, you know, today's, we have to plan for it. There is a Bhava. So I have to prepare. I have to come. So this is Bhava. So there is the sense pleasures, the five sense pleasures or the six sense, the mind. And then the mind will be of use. So in the time of the Buddha, there were 62 worldviews. Right, huh? And now, 2,600 years ago, there are more views. They said there is politics uh, when there are two people, when there's a husband and there's a wife. Right, huh? And there will be have different views. And they may quarrel over their views. So as long as if you have views, and if you cling to your views very strongly, then they may be discord. But if you have the same view, then you walk along the same road. So birds of the feather flock together. So you have views, Baba, sense pleasures, the six will be the views, and then there is the ignorance. You do not think, you, you, you do not, because you are foolishly dropping into that uh, confused state. You don't know that you are clinging to it. So some people say that, you know, you have to let go. You have to let go of even the Dharma because the Dharma is just the raft that brings you across. And once you are across, you don't carry the raft. So you would not, you will not quarrel with anybody over their views. It is their right to have their views. If they, if they are clinging very strongly to their views, nobody can uncling it unless it is knowledge. Once they see that knowledge, then they can uncling. Otherwise, they will cling. So, in the sixth, so this is Bhava Tanha. So the taints of Bhava Tanha it encompass its views. It's a lot of views, a lot of thinking. So thinking of many things. Sankara Dukkha. There's so many things to think about. And then as long as you delight in something, you will go and contact. And then when you have fulfillment in that contact, then you have this craving and clinging and becoming. And then there is renewed or rebirth. But you see that all this craving is low, hino, gamo, putujaniko, anario, ignoble, then you let go because this clinging will give you suffering. And there is no need to cling because all these are impermanent. It just arises and ceases. You cannot catch it. You catch, uh, you have a lot of, you have to use a lot of energy to cling. And if you have a lot of energy to cling, there will surely this energy will go to becoming and suffering. So it's just, as long as there's clinging, 
As long as there's craving, there's clinging, there will be becoming. So this bhava, to become, to satisfy, but mainly about the mental aspect, views. Okay? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ng. Another question is, how do you persuade people to give up sense pleasures and ignorance? Because my son still wants to go out with his friends and also to shop for his uh, poly clothes. Okay. So how do you persuade? So uh, persuade, so the Buddha says uh, to persuade somebody, you have to talk about gratification and dangers. So the gratification of going out to purchase things uh, that satisfy the sense pleasures, that is the gratification. But if you tell that the dangers uh, is uh, possibly death, if he still wants to go and contact death, because the mind is immature, he doesn't know what is disease and death. So it's like the Buddha says, you have to train horses. So if a well-trained horse, if you just say, go, get up, go, he will go. But then when you have to show him your stick, okay, you show him the stick. He said, this stick, this is the danger if you go, you know, that you will get disease and that you may die and you may you may be well and healthy, but you will spread to your granny, your grandpa, and your mommy and your daddy. So, you listen already, do you want to go? So if, let's say, that stick yet, then you say some people, you have to beat only the hair of the horse. Because when you read the number of deaths in the world, it's like so far away, Italy is so far away. It's not near me. So it's when you hear of the number of deaths and people lining, you know, and people having doctors having to choose who to live and who to die. Above 65, you can die. You don't need the ventilators. Because there's a, it's a problem of demand and supply. So if you hear this you know, it's like the hair of the horse is being ruffled by the stick. Then you may like say, oh, I better not go. And then if, let's say, you know, he hit you on the skin, that means you hear somebody nearby has passed away. So there's a lady and an Indonesian man, a local lady and an Indonesian man. So he's here, touch your skin. And then if you go deeper, it's your relatives. And then into the bone, then it's yourself. Do you need this type of stick? Or are you going to be a well-trained, disciplined to get yourself out of it? Because each person contributes to the society. And you just need one person to upset the apple cart. And so you see, when they are very obedient and they know that this is what you have to do, so if you hear that these people still goes out to enjoy the sense pleasures, then you may need to take a big stick and say no. And in India, they use a rotan. Right, huh? And in the... Maya B Beach, they need a lot of policemen to sort of uh, bring the person down. And I think somewhere, Italy, if people go out there, they will just sort of kick them off their feet. And then in China, they will use all this, uh, what the, they call drones, uh, to tell people, hey, stay home. And then when they sort of ignore the drones, then they will say, this is the police. So the authority has to come in. 
But if the authority don't put a stop, a real stop, then this will continue to spread because people may be very undisciplined. They need the stick to keep them at home because they cannot face themselves. They cannot enjoy being in their own presence. They need the sense pleasures, but they don't know how to quiet themselves to enjoy the bliss of seclusion. So, they have not learned. No, they have not learned to be quiet, to enjoy anapanasati, that during this period of seclusion is a time where you retreat into yourself and see how your fears come in. You don't want to add suffering to others. So they have to be considerate. Considerate. And after, if you uh, tell them gently and, you know, uh, you know, that this is not the way to practice, then if they don't listen, you have to, you know, communicate this to him. And if they still don't listen, then uh, it is, uh, young people say, I have a right then this right may be taken away by people of higher authority that they cannot go out. So when it comes enforced, then they don't go out. Any more questions? Yes, we have about five more questions. Oh. Dr. Ng, when you said stop contact um, because of the COVID situation, does that mean we are fearful? Stop contact. So if you stop contact, uh, yes, you are fearful. You are fearful of death. You are fearful of the dangers. But you are not shivering. You are standing steady because you know what is the right thing to do. It is, it is that you know the dangers and you do not want to contact those dangers. You do not want to go out to fight an invisible enemy. This is invisible, this is biological warfare. Right? This is this this invisible uh, thing. Uh, you have to be fearful of it. You have to avoid it. You have you know where it is lurking, then you want to avoid it. You don't want to contact. So this example is a very good example. So COVID would represent samsara. If you know the dangers of samsara and the suffering that it brings, then you must walk the way where you do not contact it again. But if you contact it, you must be able to move out. You know, the Buddha says uh, that you can be enlightened early in life or you can be enlightened at death or at interval or when you land so landing means contact and when you landed you say oh i must get out so the consciousness left effortlessly or then you say oh i shouldn't be here quickly get out so with effort and then if you are in Further, you go to Akanita world. So he tells you, you can contact Nibbana early in life, at death, in the interval, on landing. All these are contacting, contacting, contacting. And if the knowledge is not strong, then you are drawn into rebirth, into a whole lot of suffering. So if you are fearful of unwholesomeness, if you are fearful of things, then you are fearful of that contact. And you should because you have to remember the dangers and you must know the escape from gratification and dangers. And it's a noble eightfold path that you have to uh, develop and walk on. 
So on the Noble Eightfold Path, can you elaborate on the right speech? And what are the consequences of uh, unskillful or wrong speech? Let me take photograph and only laugh. So you repeat the uh, question again. Can you elaborate on the right speech? And what are the consequences of unskillful or wrong speech? So the right speech must be truthful, correct, beneficial, agreeable, welcoming. These are the five qualities of right speech. So when we say true, the four noble truths. Correct means it's not fake news. It's correct, factually correct. Okay? So, the vi so this disease is caused by a virus. It's factually correct. True, four noble truths. Beneficial. So we tell people beneficial. This is beneficial for your well-being to wash your hands, to distance yourself, to guard yourself, and that these are beneficial for yourself, for your family, for society. This is beneficial. It may not be agreeable, but huh? it's beneficial. But then if you say it's, it's agreeable, no? people can accept it, then it's agreeable. Then it's welcoming. Oh. Thank goodness there's a way out. It welcomes the steps. Okay, maybe the budget is more welcoming, huh? whatever. So these are the right speech. So, if, so the Buddha only talk when it is true, correct and beneficial. He won't say it is welcoming or agreeable. If it's agreeable or welcoming, he doesn't need to say it. But he only say what is speech that is true, correct, and beneficial. So, like a vacha kota, you know, the vacha kota said, I, "There's no self. Ah. Is there's no self? Is it?" But he doesn't reply him because his mind, vacha kota's mind, is not mature to receive it. So it must be the right timing. So it is true, correct, beneficial to that particular person. Then you speak. If it's too early, it's not acceptable. It's not welcoming. So the Buddha will speak yeah, timingly. So you have to choose. This is right speech. Of course, you have false speech. False speech is unwholesome. False speech is really unwholesome. The consequences of unwholesomeness uh, because it's false. What are the dangers? It is to the suffering. So, because it's false speech. And it's going to the lower realms because it's a false speech. Because a false speech when you lie. So, the Buddha told Rahula, his son, when you lie, you have thrown away your practice. So the son wash, bring a container to wash his feet. Then after that, uh, he says, uh, okay, son, if you lie, then you would have you throw the water away. You have thrown away the practice. And if you lie, look at this empty container. Your practice is empty. And that if you lie, then he put the container upside down. You, your practice is upside down. So you have thrown away your practice, you have, uh, you know, it's empty, it's discarded, then it is hollow. So all this practice that you say you are practicing uh, is nothing. There is no, there is no good results out of it. Bad. bad begets bad results. So the worst results is to the lot of suffering. Nobody can trust you if there is false speech. Nobody will trust you anymore. 
when you see it uh, in a colorful, colorful way, I say this for your benefits, you know. But behind every person, uh, other beings uh, can see your intentions. People can see your intentions, although you may have colorful speech, you know. So it is with the intentions that you speak right speech. False speech, you have ill intentions, you will have ill results. So it will taint the whole being. So false speech uh, will sort of bring you far away from the truth. Far, far away from the truth. Far, far away from Nibbana. Far, far away from realization. And if that is so, then you will be in samsara, suffering life and life again and again. Not seeing the light. You, know, you see, this is VIP, vision, insight, panya, vija, a local light. You will never see the light and you will be in darkness. So, the false speech is important part of the uh, Noble Eightfold Path. So, it's called Noble Silence. You don't want to, if you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to say anything, uh, you don't utter false speech, you rather keep quiet. If people say you're dumb, you're mute, okay, you know, don't bother, you know. So, you must treasure your own practice. It's very important to treasure your own practice. Otherwise, uh, you, can, you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. So this is right speech. Thank you, Dr. Ng. What can one do when one clings to one's family? We, uh, doesn't want uh, anything bad to happen to the loved ones. So this is normal to protect your, your, your family members and you do not want bad things to happen to them. But the Buddha says, uh, no matter how much wanting, uh, it all depends on dependent conditionality. You need like everybody to be singing the same song, walking the same path to protect. Huh? So there were two acrobats, right? So the teacher acrobat tell the student acrobat, hey, you take care of uh, me, okay? Then the student acrobat says, I take care of myself. You take care of yourself. When you take care of yourself, in this acrobatic world, you protect the others. You protect yourself and you protect the others. So he says, we, I have to take care of myself. So each individual has to play his part. If the individual does not play his part, then conditions will lead to the suffering. And then death, becoming, birth, and then... Uh, so this is ignorant beings beyond your control. They have, they meet things or meet people, they come into contact and they have views. So you wish them, you no know, good health, safe, but if they choose other things, despite all the knowledge, mundane knowledge, they choose, uh, these are conditions. And even if they have kept to it, uh, kept to all this social distancing, whatever, guard themselves, and if they do get it, because sometimes you don't know, because the virus may be so overwhelming and that your immune system uh, that cannot fight, so then the person still dies. So the Buddha says, uh, no matter how great the system, the medical system, the doctors, the nurses, the person still die. No matter how good. And sometimes uh, no medical nursing or doctor staff, the person still survive. 
So there are lots of conditions, but because you need doctor and nursing help you know, to actually you know, help them, because some of them can survive with doctors and nurses. So you provide the conditions for that to happen. So you optimize the conditions. So he says there are a lot of conditions. So you cannot, you cannot uh, predict conditions because conditions change a lot. You can know what is right and do what is right. The other party has to do what is right. You cannot control fully. So that's why it's the conditions, depending on conditions. But how do you uh, cling, not cling to one's family? If you cling to one person, it's very normal because there's an attachment. If there is no attachment, then there is no clinging. So the COVID will cling to lung tissue, airways. It's a natural attachment. If you have family members you love very dearly, you will have clinging. But if you see that family members are also subject to disease and death, there is an understanding. So he says that one fortunate attachment is only to arising and ceasing, to arising and ceasing, and not to family members. So if you can see that all conditioned things are impermanent, then there is, it's impossible to cling. So this topic of Dhamma Chaka Pavatana said there's suffering and there's an end of suffering. It's to see through that there is, all these things are impermanent. You know, there is no self, but just conditions coming and ceasing. So you have to see it eh, for yourself. And you have to let go if you know uh, for yourself. But Dr. Ng, if we are fearful of COVID-19 and the samsara, doesn't it mean that we are clinging to an idea of self? All oh, right. So you are clinging uh, to the idea of suffering. So the goal is suffering. First, you must have chanda. First, there must be chanda. This chanda is the desire for enlightenment. But after you have achieved your goal, it is you let it go. So the, this same question was asked to Venerable Ananda, who replied, if you want to come to this place, you have to have the desire to come to this place. You have to walk here, or you have to take a bus, you have to take a transport to reach here. Once you reach here, you, forgot, you forget about the bus and the transport. You have arrived. You have to let go. So once you know, you have let go. So you have to, you have to use the tools. You have to use the tools to realize. You have to use this changing body and changing mind and changing ignorance to overcome the end of the ignorance. Because you can see that there is suffering if you do not practice. You have to have fear. So a bhikkhu, the word the bhikkhu is to be afraid of samsara, dangers of samsara, the meaning of a bhikkhu. Besides being taking an elm's bow, is to be afraid of samsara, to be fearful of samsara. Then you will take that path to reach the destination so that there will be no more fear. Dr. Ng, if we practice renunciation, what is the impact on our work and social progress? Renunciation. Uh, of sense pleasures. Renunciation of sense pleasures uh, is to... This one is not to go into extremes. It's not to go into extremes of, I must get that particular food. I must listen to that particular music. Die, die, must eat this. 
Dai Dai must dance. Dai Dai must. So it is the thing called Dai Dai. But you, if it says that if you do not have, is it okay? If you do not have this, is it okay? So of these sense pleasures, renunciation of sense pleasures, it develops uh, according to the maturity of the person on the path. It cannot be forced. It cannot be forced upon the person who is not mature enough to give up. You cannot force a person who enjoys sense pleasures to say, take that off. The person must see the repulsiveness of those sense pleasures. Then he develops a disenchantment and a dispassion for these sense pleasures. That these are fleeting. It has no, no uh, substance in it. You eat, you shit. What can you use with your shit? Scientists say you can extract phosphorus from it. But then, why we need to have so much toilet paper in, uh, in stock? Because it's foul. Our feces is foul. We need to remove this thing that come out from ourselves that we love so much. Uh, we love ourselves so much. But something that come out of ourselves, uh, we see it, we have been conditioned uh, to think it's distasteful, it's repulsive. I must get as much, I must get as much toilet paper. So you can think that you actually think that this body is repulsive. If it's repulsive, then why do you have so much sense pleasures? So it depends on the individual development of the person on the path. If you if you uh, take it away when he's not ready, then it will be aversion. It has to be a gradual training. Right, huh? And there are so many shopping malls, no? There were, uh, so you wouldn't uh, be lack of people uh, who, uh, who sort of don't have sense pleasures. Such as the Buddha's uh, Sakyan country says, all the young men are out to become monks. There will be no monk, uh, men left in the... But then how many will want to go out? There will be sense pleasures, there will be marriages, there will be children. There will be shopping malls. They are interested in the senses, the stimulation of the five senses. So. Don't worry, the economy will still turn. Maybe just 1% of the world will sort of move away from sense pleasures. Most of the people in the world, 99% of the world, are indulging in sense pleasures. But its sense pleasures are just temporary, nothing substantial. Don't be intoxicated with youth or sense pleasures. The Buddha says, because death will come. Mortality will come, Mr. Mortality will come, knock on your door. And then all your time in this life have been spent on non-essential things like sense pleasures instead of the practice. So you have a choice. So they say ignorance, volition. Everybody has a choice to do what is right for themselves and others. 12.30, any more questions? We have last two questions. Okay. Second last question is, the world leaders will implement the view, their views to ensure the best possible outcome. What is the right view for this type of clinging to their views? Oh, so the world leaders is equivalent to the kings of the time of the Buddha. So the kings are conditional beings. And I remember reading something uh, that your wealth uh, will be taken by kings and ministers and thieves and fire. Hey, they are all in the same category. So if you are talking about leaders, they, in their mind, they have to make sure the economy runs. So, but they have to do it rightly. You have the 
you have the people's heart, you know, the people's welfare, the people's benefits, as well as other beings living in the world, in the world environment. You have to consider all this because the leader are the one you know, driving the directions. So you must have wise and knowledgeable leaders to lead. And if they are not wise and knowledgeable, you have to be wise and knowledgeable. And you lead your life wisely to get out of suffering. Okay, better the last question. Last question. Uh, Dr. Ng, you said the wheel of Dharma is turned and it will not stop. But phenomena is impermanent. How do you reconcile the two? All right. The wheel of the Dharma, so it's the same thing. The wheel, in that, uh, the Buddha says that now the wheel of the Dharma has been turned. Factually, it's correct. So when Kondana realized, so factually, the wheel of the Dharma has been turned. Now, 2,600 years later, the wheel of the Dharma is still turning. And no holy man, no deva, no being will be able to stop it. Okay, that is, this is the nature, this is the truth. Because the truth is that all conditioned things are impermanent. Who can stop that truth that all conditioned things are impermanent, arise and cease? It's a truth. Like the sun rises, the sun sets, it's a truth. Arising, ceasing, arising, ceasing. All conditioned things arise and cease. This truth will be there even if the earth is not there. But people will not practice the, according to this truth. When they have no longer respect for the four foundations of mindful, that means they know mindfulness. They know respect for the Buddha's teachings. No respect for the Dharma. No respect for the Sangha. No respect for the training. Like all this is the training. If you don't have the discipline to train, to keep your precepts, virtue samadhi panya, if you do not have that, then how? The Dharma will end. Because it requires each practitioner. It will end if there is no respect for Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, training, concentration. We do not respect for virtue, samadhi, and panya. If you have no love for it, eh, and everybody is going into the sensual realm, eh, going to enjoy, eh, eat, drink, and be merry, for we do not know that after this death, where will we go? If people do not believe in karma, who do not believe in rebirth, and that there is a way to end the rebirth. So if you do not know, then uh, when everybody uh, is going that way, then there is the end. The Buddha says in his later suttas that when this no respect, it will end. Because if you are not practicing, it will end. Uh, but the truth, this truth of arising and ceasing of the conditioned things, the whole universe is the conditioned things. It arises and goes. The sun will come, the sun will go. Sun rises, sun dies. Planets come and planets go. Stars that you see in the sky may be not in existence truly. May have, these are just the remnants of the light that comes. So the truth is that conditioned things arise and cease. There's nothing permanent in them. But then the Dharma may disappear because there's no practitioners. The truth will be there. 
Any more? Thank you, Dr. Ng. Okay. That's all we have for today. Thank we you. shall uh, close the session with dedication of merits to all sentient beings and uh, to departed relatives. Sapa Sampati Siddhya Etta Vata Cha Amhehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabbe Buddha Anumodantu Sapa Sampati Siddhya Etta Vata Cha Amhehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabbe sata anumodantu Sabbe sampati sidia Dedik menyati nang hotu Sukita hontu nyatayo Idang menyati nang hotu Sukita hontu nyatayo Idang menyati nang hotu Sukita hon tunya tayo. Closing homage. Arahang sama sambuddho bhagawa buddhang bhagawantang abhiwademi. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Sufatipano Bhagavato Sawakasango Sanggang Namami Sadu Sadu Sadu